Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Now, today's guest is somebody very special. Actually, I've been trying to track him down for a very, very long time, and we actually ended up meeting at NER, which is the Neural Engineering Conference, which is the IEEE EMBS conference that happened in San Francisco on March. So that was really cool. It was a really good conference, by the way. It was really, really fun. Lots of cool science, lots of cool posters, talks, everything like this. So I was really excited because I've been trying to track him down for like a year, at least. We met maybe two years ago. So it's been quite a while. So I'm very happy to be able to bring you this, his work on in vivo calcium imaging. And he's one of the few people, as I said in the show, I was quite impressed that he actually turned down joining Elon Musk in Neuralink's team. So that was very interesting. We were able to talk about that. So we will talk more on the other side. Okay, TK Kazai, pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks. <laughs> I think you're the person I've worked the hardest for to have mm. on the show. It was maybe even like two years, <laughs> but I think it's going to be worth it because you do some really fascinating work. I mean, you started out kind of doing carbon fiber electrodes, now kind of looking at in vivo stuff. I don't know, how would you describe what your contribution is to the brain computer interface? I don't know. I, I mean, my interests are in understanding both the material and the design aspects of the actual implant, as well as the biology of neural degeneration and regeneration around these implant interfaces. So it really covers both sides of the, mm -hmm. the spectra. Okay. How would you describe the in vivo calcium channeling? I mean, this is kind of what you've been doing recently, what you've been publishing. What's, I guess, the goals with this? I guess, what do you mean specifically? What do you hope to accomplish with this? Ultimately, what we care about is to understand how the signals are being generated by the brain and how we're then able to detect that signal. So that's sort of what we're trying to get is and understand is with an electrode, you're sticking an electrode in, it's sort of like a black box. We don't really understand what it is we're recording from. We really don't know what that neuron looks like, the health of it, how the spatial distribution of these neurons talking. So I guess we're trying to shine some light on that using two-photon microscopy. And it's not just the neurons, right? The glia and the vasculature also play an important role in modulating the activity of the neural network. So we're trying to see how all these pieces fit together as well. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so what's kind of your feelings from this that, that you found out? It's not only the neurons. This is my you know, suspicion as well. It's like everybody's focusing on the neurons, but all these other support cells may be equally important. What is yeah, your... I mean, you know, astrocytes modulate neurotransmitter cleanup as well as recycling back into the neurons to repackage and release you know, when an action potential reaches the synapse. Astrocytes also modulate the neurovasculature to replenish the oxygen and the nutrients as the neurons use them up. Oligodendrocytes not just myelinate to increase conduction speed, but also provide important metabolic support, lactate shuttles, as well as trophic factors to keep neurons alive and functioning properly. We also have microglia that have been shown to modulate dendritic activity. I mean, all of these things are important. I think we've been just focusing on too small of a piece to really understand how the brain works in general. And then what are some of the most important factors, do you think, that are important in terms of electrode design? So stiffness, size, how would you weigh those two, I guess? How would I weigh stiffness and size? It's complicated because they're both intertangled as far as if you modulate the size, you modulate the stiffness. If you modulate the stiffness, you can alter other properties that you may have unintentionally changed, like the resistance and the capacitance of the material. And that can also overall impact the performance of the device. So we put out a giant review in advanced materials or advanced functional materials last year, 2018, where we talked about all of these trade-offs and balances. And you know, some of the early research really focused in on just optimizing a single parameter. And we're learning now that you, know, you really have to pay attention to the whole system not just one piece of it. Making sure, but I guess that's not science, right? Like t science is all about testing one thing and excluding everything else, right? So how do you do that, I guess? Well, on the science side, yes, right? But on the engineering side, one of the DARPA managers 
uh, and then NIH people were saying, you know, at, at the end of the day, you have to make a device that works. Maybe it's not perfect, but it has to work. So I guess that's the engineering component of neural engineering, which may be slightly different focus than the science side of it. And actually, now I'm realizing we haven't really covered, I guess, your results for the calcium imaging, the two-photon imaging. Like, what have you found out? I think it was really excellent, like, kind of reversing a paradigm, isn't it? Yeah, we have a number of other paradigms that are in the works, but I guess in this aspect, one of the things we showed was that higher frequency stimulation leads to decrease in antidromic activation over long periods of time, which is sort of contrary to expectations, but you know, that's where the, the data is. The mechanisms are really complicated. There's a number of different things that could be going on there, and we haven't started teasing that apart yet, but that's sort of one of the next directions. But, you know, that's sort of the nature of science is sometimes you have to just characterize what's going on so you can start teasing them apart with hypotheses. You have to start with an observation. Mm -hmm. So this is just an observation that goes contrary to expectation. Mm -hmm. Now the real science starts. So I guess for people that are like doing something, doing the dishes right now and, you know, listening, basically you were able to find that like a different stimulation frequencies you had different effects, right? Like, so it would go further or closer, I guess the reach, and then I guess the decay as well, right? Like they're tired out, something like that. Yeah, that certainly could be part of it. The metabolic depletion, I don't know. We'll have to see. Cool. And so what are kind of some next steps? I mean, you don't have to reveal any grants in the, in the process or something like this. What are you kind of going towards with this? It's an infinite parameter space. So we'll start, with, <laughs> we'll start picking away at the infinite. Well, and that, that's why I like about it is because, you know, you're doing in vivo stuff and biology is messy, right? Like there's a 20, 30 percent noise between animals, between everything. And it's just like you can sacrifice an animal, but it's not going to tell you anything unless that the experiment that you were doing was really like had a huge, enormous effect. But this way you can kind of track like the same animal over time too. I, I think that's a huge benefit. I guess the future, obviously, that's where that lies. But I'm surprised that more people aren't doing that. Well, it's not easy. Certainly it's taken us a long time to figure out all the bugs and kinks. And there's still issues that we're still struggling to, to address. But yeah, I, you know, a lot of the early work and there's certainly a lot of good work that came out of it, but was focused on postmortem histology. And you can sort of see the end point, but you can't really tell how it got to that point. So we've been really excited about using two-photon microscopy to look at how degeneration, tissue reaction, the gliosis, and sometimes even the resolution of them evolves over time. Yeah, and you were talking about it's difficult. What are some of the challenges that you've had in this? What are some of the challenges that we had? You know, head capping is always a challenge. And when you start talking about doing awake sort of behaving or awake, awake head fixed, there's a lot of challenges associated with that. You know, we have now a number of different treadmills based on what experimental paradigms we're seeking to do. So things like that, you know, just head fixing, securing, head posting, all these different issues have. It's like Jack Judy was saying, packaging, mm -hmm. the packaging aspect. And certainly there's a packaging aspect to the in vivo imaging as well. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of variables in this. There's a lot of steps to it that make it be just right. And, and basically you anesthetize the animal, you put it into like a mount and then image it, right? So it comes to and then it might start freaking out and like break its head cap or whatever, right? So that's why you have the treadmill. So there's a way, there's an outlet for the energy. Right, exactly. They don't freak out, something like that. Wow. And then you were working previously on the carbon fiber electrodes. Do you want to talk a little bit about this? And what's your opinion on this as well? Well, what specifically do you mean? So do you want to talk about your work with the carbon fiber electrodes? Yeah, I guess I just don't know where to start with. General summary, General maybe. General summary. Um, yeah, because you're one of the first people to, you were the first person, right, to basically make carbon fibers and put them in, into the Yeah, into the brain I mean, so we started this work in 2008. We wrote a grant and got it in 2009, part of the Obama Challenge Grant. There was another group that published before we were able to on the chemical sensing side using mm -hmm. fused silica. We used perylene instead, and that seemed to work better for the electrophysiology. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so we were one of the first ones to do. It's funny because originally my advisor was not quite on board doing it, focusing on silicon devices. Mm -hmm. So when he heard that I wanted to do carbon, he was sort of, I don't know if this is what you should be doing. I don't know that this is the next generation of stuff. But, you know, you sort of sneak experiments here and there and you show them the data and you know, really it is that on board. Yeah. So this is kind of like your Google, they have like 20% time yeah, where, the, where yeah, you do absolutely. So this is kind of like a secret project. If you're in my lab, you know, my students have, yeah, 20% time basically. To How did you do that? Because, okay, so I have a few pet theories of my own and, and I really want to try it out, but with animals and, and like all these like studies, I don't know where to start. Like it feels like I would need to get somebody big on board 
in order to try this stuff out. So how do you do that? Uh, I mean, I don't know that you necessarily need to. You know, do your homework, do the literature search, put together the idea, vet it, you know, maybe have a couple of people look it over and people you trust look mm -hmm. it over and see if they can punch any holes in it and then go from there. You know, the first paper that I did, we just sat down for 20 minutes and said, well, how do we get PDMS probes in the brain? They're really flexible, they're really soft. We tried doing shuttles, but there's this hydrophobic interaction that sticks to, that causes these shuttles to stick to PDMS probes. Well, you know, maybe there's ways to use adhesion molecule or a self-assembled monolayer that you know, is really sticky but slippery, depending on the wetting conditions. It's not very expensive. We looked up the parts. It was in total maybe $200 for all these tiny pieces. I got it. And tried it out on a Friday afternoon and <laughs> it worked. Wow. Monumentous Friday afternoon, maybe. But then you did animal experiments with that or no? Yeah, we did animal experiments okay. with that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so you just kind of like added that, did something with the protocol that was already started and then just... Right. So, yeah. So the graduate student that I was working with, Jason Bryan, was doing all these biocompatibility studies with silicon and poly PDMS probes. And so at the end of one of his experiments, we just said, well, let's just tack this on. That was five minutes, ten minutes, and that's awesome. Got it to work. Yeah, yeah. I think we need to do more of that because, well, I don't know. I don't know how common how common is that actually to just that twenty percent time. I don't know. I mean, it depends on the lab culture and the advisors and the principal investigators. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. So you know, honestly, the biggest, maybe most impactful thing, or like the kind of thing that that surprised me or impressed me the most about you when we met at SFN in two thousand seventeen was you said you were approached by Elon Musk for Neuralink, and you guys talked. He wanted you to like join the team to co-found it, but you turn them down. Do you want to talk about this? What they're doing is pretty amazing. It's quite an effort and quite a feat what they're trying to accomplish. And there's a number of challenges, but at the same time, there's a number of things that they're able to do because of sort of the funding model mm -hmm. or really the lack of funding model associated with sort of an Elon Musk company that they can pursue some of the less sexy problems. Oh, really? Right. So, Interesting. again, you, you heard Jack Judy always complain about packaging. No one's really addressing packaging issues. And that's one of the things that they really have an opportunity to tackle. Hmm. Now, for me, again, I'm really interested at, on sort of the material interface along with the biological interface. Mm -hmm. And that's something that they weren't quite equipped to advance. And if you look at Elon Musk's companies, you know, other companies, they're all areas where the science is pretty well established hmm. right? space flight energy scavenging electric cars the science that all that technology is based on is pretty well agreed upon and what he's bringing into the mix is a new way to arrange all of those sciences arrange all those physics instead of building it on tradition and just starting from scratch and saying what makes the most sense with brain computer interfaces we don't have all of the knowledge we don't have all the sciences so for me, it made more sense to stay where I am so that we can do our part in providing the science so that he can push his company and his visions forward. So maybe, yeah, I guess what I'm hearing is with that funding model, you can really race forward towards something. But nobody's like really agreed on which direction we need to go in this field. But like versus like what you said, aeronautics or like you know, space flight, people know the direction. So racing towards that makes sense. But in this, you could be racing towards the wrong. Yeah, and Susan thing. Baggins also talked about in one of the discussion sessions that you know failure analysis is very common in sort of industry because the last thing you want is your product to fail in the field. In academia, it's more about where is the innovation, where is the advance, where is the you know really fun, interesting stuff, and we don't really get into the boring nitty gritty of trying to address where all the things can go wrong and how to fix them. And again, for a company, that's something that they really have the opportunities to do. Whereas trying to get something like that funded in an NIH grant is very challenging. Yeah. Not impossible, but very challenging. Yeah, definitely. The model is, is different than the typical Silicon Valley style thing. And this was, I guess, displayed by Theranos. It was like, oh, they're like promising stuff, but you know, you have to get regulatory approval and everything like this. That was a huge mistake that they did. Also, their technology didn't work. But, but yeah, it's a different beast, this medical device space, because it's much more complicated maybe, huh? Yeah, yeah. So that's a slightly different issue. But yeah, it is a very different environment. And so I've kind of gathered that, you know, people like your PIs, professors, they kind of have a glimpse of, into what they're doing. 
And so you kind of know the goings and works in the last, I guess, two or three years, something like this. I guess, has your opinion changed? Are you happy with your decision, I guess? Yeah, we're in a position where our lab is looking at different forms of neural degeneration, how to treat them, not just in the brain-computer interface, right, the glial scarring in the kill zone, not just that, but also pushing our technology and pushing our engineering towards understanding and trying to address or treat other diseases. So. For example, we just had a publication and then a couple more in review looking at a multiple sclerosis model. Mm. And we're just launching now looking into Alzheimer's model. Interesting. So how would that work? Or what's the, I guess, synopsis of those papers? Yeah. So the idea is that there you still have neural degeneration around these implants. And a lot of the pathways are very similar to neural degeneration that occurs in diseases. With disease models, it's very difficult to pinpoint the evolution of the disease because you don't really know where things start. You don't know the scale of it. You don't know what the time course is usually because you know by the time that you can detect it with MRI or any other sort of assay, the disease has progressed quite a bit. Mm. And the only way to look is to sacrifice the animal and look at the brain. And at that point, it's sort of a gamble on is, is the disease well progressed or is it before the disease starts? And especially when you look at like the NFL research now, right? Head trauma, stroke, TBI can catalyze a lot of these diseases in the younger population mm. if they're genetically prone to it. Mm-hmm. So the idea here is to then use a really focal injury model to catalyze the disease in disease models and then study the evolution. Because you know, you know, if you stick an electrode in the brain, you're causing an injury, mm-hmm. you know, when exactly you put that in there, you know where exactly you put that in there. So you can watch the evolution of the disease grow from that injury. And you can also try to include intervention strategies to control it. And do you even get a sensor Mm -hmm. at the epicenter of the injury that you can use to monitor the overall health of the tissue? So this has sort of been... So a lot of, like, sounds like almost all your work is kind of like not having to sacrifice the animal or like long-term diagnostics, like continuous monitoring, something like that. Yeah, well, certainly there are limitations to things like two-photon microscopy if you're trying to get down to a molecular level on a protein level or a DNA or RNA level. So we still use some of those techniques to supplement our analyses. Yeah, you know, you got to get a multimodal perspective on the problem or else you're only getting part of the picture. Yeah, definitely. Especially in a noisy system, like I said, a noisy system like biology. If it was beams and, you know, buckling stresses of of aluminum or something like this, that's pretty consistent, plus or minus 1%, 2%, something like this. But this is completely different from person to person, animal to animal, something like this. So I'm curious, how did you get into this? What's kind of your art of getting into this? Yeah, I hated biology. (laughs) So now you're doing what you can to overturn it. (laughs) Yeah, so, I mean, if you think about biology classes in elementary school, they were mostly memorization, mostly ecology, anatomy, just memorizing parts. And it wasn't until my sophomore year in high school when I got sort of pushed into this one science class. Hmm. And this, the teacher for that class was also getting his master's at the local university. He was trying to teach us what an ATP synthase was and how it worked. And he was kept saying that there's this little turning knob and it pushes the, it takes a proton gradient and pushes the AT, ADP and PI together to form ATP. And we're all staring at him blankly because we didn't know what he was talking about mm-hmm. and had these really simple cartoon drawings that didn't make sense to us. Hmm. So he went back to the university where he was taking this class, brought back some 3D models, some crystal structures, some animated models, hmm. and showed us, well, here's a stem, here's a binding site, here's a catalytic site, here's where the proton enters, and then the turbine spins, and here's where the proton comes out, and all of these things put together causes this reaction. And up until that point, I was always interested in robotics and engineering yeah, and exactly. building stuff, because that's sort of what we did came from a not quite economically privileged upbringing so you know we all built our own stuff to play with so and that that's when it hit me that biology was in fact the smallest and most energy efficient and replenishable machine Mm -hmm. nano machines and that's what got me interested in sort of bioengineering 
So maybe once this teacher showed that actually it is made of machines, it is just a little motor, that's when you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, I'll just... biology is, you know, really efficient engineering. And, it, you know, we talked about noise in the system, but really the noise is there because of the complexity. Hmm. It's, it's not actually noise. Some of it might be, but for the most part, that noise actually has a meaning to it. We just haven't really been able to decode all of that. Hmm. You don't think it's like a stochastic, just like random firing or whatever, or like random thing happening? Well, like that randomness might actually have a purpose to it, too. So you're going to like look into the noise and reading the tea leaves. <laughs> I, I don't know if we'll do that, but yeah. there One are day. people doing that. One day in a hundred years, people will be like, oh, that means somebody on the other side of the, the planet ate a cheeseburger. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> so what's your long-term goal? Like in 10 years, 20 years, what do you hope to do? What's your hope for the field? Why especially brain-computer interfaces? Like what's your overarching dream, I guess? Well, so I guess if I take a step back and sort of talk about sort of the philosophy of you know engineering and the impact of engineering, right? I mean, things are always going to improve. Right? Things are always going to one-up, right? You if you look at phones, you know, the original cell phones were the size of a brick. Now we had flip phones that were really small, and now we're getting big again, but having these large touch screens. Mm -hmm. now, the technology is always going to evolve. The technology is always going to change. So just, you know, try and zero in and say the carbon fiber electrodes are going to be the best for everything for forever. I don't know. Right? That's not going to be true. I know mm -hmm. that that much is not going to be true. Mm -hmm. But if you think about scientific discoveries, principles and theories and foundational knowledge things build off of that that lasts forever photoelectric effect is still true technology is evolving off of that principle solar panels to rechargeable energy cells right? so so to more directly answer your question you know, my interest is even 5 10 20 years is to keep advancing the frontiers of science the biology and the material science between the interfaces of brain machine interfaces so you want to be one of the giants that we stand on the shoulders of. <laughs> I don't know about the giants, but yeah. I mean, the idea is a discovery lasts forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's amazing like how collaborative and how much it builds off of everybody. Like, It's still kind of blowing my mind. Like, A small paper comes out and it's just like, oh, this actually ended up being a huge thing. And you know, here we are sitting in a hall full of posters representing six months of somebody's work. And some of them are going to be really huge and like change the field from one moment to the next, I guess. So that's pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, is there anything that we didn't cover that you want to mention? Not that I can think of. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, and I've really appreciated this. I thought this was interesting, and I, I think, as it's been shown already, like we're going to be running into each other. It's a small field. Everybody runs into each other a few times a year. So I'm looking forward to more of your cool research that's going to be coming out. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hey guys, hopefully you enjoy that. Yeah, I thought that was a nice interview. I really think that we covered a good amount of what he's been working on. But, you know, he does so much stuff that I think we also barely scratched the surface. And, you know, he might be on a lot because we're always meeting each other at, at conferences and everything like this. And honestly, he works on a lot of the stuff that I'm very much interested in. And Rising Star, hotshot researcher. So some definitely somebody you should be looking out for. Very cool. So if you enjoyed it, then let me know. And we will do more of these kind of in-person interviews at conferences. I think I'm going to start doing this more and maybe ditch the filming equipment because that kind of gets in the way and slows things down and kind of scares people, <laughs> especially scientists. Ooh, they're a scaredy bunch. So, and especially the half hour of setup that's required, you know, to be able to do that. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. And until next time, this is the Neural Implant Podcast. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.